The Horus Heresy is the founding myth of the Warhammer 40,000 setting, but the Great Crusade is the backdrop that gives the heresy its meaning. A time of hope when the Emperor led the legions out across the galaxy to unify humanity. And some legions were at the forefront of this, shining examples of the Emperor's new order. But others weren't. Other legions were built as horrific tools of conquest, necessary evils that would almost certainly be discarded when their usefulness was over. And the story the story of the Blood Angels is mostly one of how they avoided that fate. Hiya, welcome back to Heresy 101. In this little series, I'm gonna go through all the lore for each of Warhammer's Space Marine legions, particularly their origin story in the grim days of the Horus Heresy. In that, I'll take a look at where they are at the start of the Heresy and how they got there, and then what happens to them during the Heresy. So before I begin, it's worth saying that this video series contains spoilers for many, many Heresy books. At the end of the Great Crusade, the Blood Angels were one of the most favoured and gloried of the Space Marine Legions, and their Primarch, the Angel Sanguinius, one of the most well-loved amongst his brothers. But they were never meant to be that. In fact, when the Ninth Legion were formed, it was for a purpose much darker, and few expected them to still be around when the Great Crusade was over. The history of the Ninth Legion, like all the legions, starts during the Unification Wars on Terra. As the Emperor's conquest of Old Earth came to a close, the 20 Legiones Astartes, the very first Space Marines, were being field tested in small units across the planet. The technology needed to create the legions was still in its infancy, and so the legions grew slowly, many only fielding a few hundred warriors at the head of much bigger armies of mortal troops. But the Ninth Legion were different. The Ninth Legion was much much larger and deployed on its own to some of the most horrific of Terra's environments. The rad-soaked wastelands that were the result of years of warfare, where they were assigned to purge the shambling hordes of twisted mutants that populated them. The Ninth's gene seed seemed almost designed for this, and had a very low rejection rate, turning the most twisted human tribesmen of the rad wastes into an angelic warrior, identical to his fellow Astartes as if cast from a mould. And since they were deployed on their own into environments only Astartes could bear, they fought without the logistical or armoured support a lot of the other legions had. They were a horde, an inferno of infantry ravaging the land and killing anything in their way, often in brutal close combat. Their way of war had a massive casualty rate, but the bloody-handed apothecaries of the Ninth kept the Legion at strength. In fact, out in the wastelands, cults grew up around them, pilgrims swarming their camps, hoping for the chance to be raised up as one of the Emperor's angels. Ministers started tending to this flock of camp followers, the Red Brothers preying on the superstition of the wasteland refugees, at least until near the end of unification, the Emperor declared the Imperial Truth, the ban on all religion, and the Legion turned on its unwanted prophets and preachers. But this massive casualty rate suffered by the Legion and the quirks of their gene seed had other effects. In the gene seed of the Ninth Primarch, the Omophagia implant was very active. This was the implant that allowed an Astartes warrior to gain the knowledge of his enemies by consuming their corpses. At first, this became used as a tactic, the angelic warriors of the Ninth stalking the cooling battlefields and consuming the corpses of their enemies to learn more about their tactics. They became known as the Eaters of the Dead. But with their casualties climbing, this also became a way to retain knowledge, recently promoted warriors consuming the bodies of their superiors to keep their experience within the Legion, which also led to a tradition of taking on the name and identity of their superiors. Some warriors were known to have fought and died multiple times over the course of the Crusade, earning the Legion other titles, the Immortal Ninth or the Revenant Legion. Their Legion master, Ishidur Osuros, led the Ninth from their inception all the way until the rediscovery of their Primarch, though it's likely that that was a number of different warriors. As the Crusade spread out into the solar system, the Immortal Ninth were isolated again. Instead of fighting alongside the Lunar Wolves or the Iron Hands, they were thrown into hellish battles, suffering huge losses as always, but then emerging at full effectiveness, their apothecaries plying their trade on whatever human subjects could be taken from the defeated enemy. With each victory, the dire legends that surrounded the Ninth Legion grew and spread. They were the spectres that haunted the wild places at the edge of the Great Crusade 
blades advance, the terrors loosed by the Emperor to clear his path across the stars. It was a duty that they accepted with a grim pride, never shirking the mantle that they wore in his name, and never balking from the tasks assigned them. Each campaign was undertaken with a cold fury that stood them apart from the Emperor's other attack dogs and hidden murderers. A quiet, brooding hunger for blood and death that was as terrifying as it was effective. The Legion was disliked, their methods considered distasteful at best. High Command and the other Legions kept them isolated from the bulk of Crusade forces, and wherever they went, cults and superstition grew each time they conquered. The rapid replacement, their status as pariahs, all started to take their toll, and around them grew whispers of madness. A reckoning seemed imminent, and then, by an expeditionary fleet led by both Horus and the Emperor, the fifth Primarch was discovered. As the Astartes project neared its completion on Terra and the Ninth Legion was being deployed into its first blood-soaked massacres, the Primarchs, the 20 superhuman generals and genetic templates for the Legions, were stolen away, cast to the warp and thrown out into the galaxy. The pod of the Ninth Primarch came to rest on the moon of Baal Secundus, a hot and arid place polluted by the fallout of ancient wars. Radiation storms battered the dry surface and the population that remained was split between hordes of shambling mutants and tribes of desperate humans eking out a nomadic life in their ancient rad suits. Sanguinius, taken in and raised by one of these tribes, had quickly become a saviour to the human survivors. A demigod, angelic wings sprouting from his back, immune to the rad storms and able to fight back the hordes of mutants. To them, he was a messiah, a symbol of hope, and eventually, without encouraging the practice, he came to be worshipped by them. When the Emperor made planet fall on his world, Sanguinius went out to meet him alone and pledged himself to his cause, asking only one thing in return, that the tribes be spared their superstitions and be allowed to continue as they always had, without censure in the name of the Imperial Truth. And the Emperor agreed his craft would be the last of the expedition to land on Baal Secundus. The Primarch went up to meet his new legion and rather than issuing orders, knelt before them, offering them his allegiance. Sanguinius withheld his judgement, accompanying them into war on Turgar, but in their first few battles he saw their darkness. In particular, a tendency to become totally lost to slaughter and recognise this flaw as the same one he had. Sanguinius was another of the Primarchs with the dubious gift of foresight and he saw a future where his new sons were destroyed, turned into monsters monsters and lost to a darkness he knew himself, but they were still salvageable. The Ninth were bloody killers, but only because that's how they'd always fought. They took pride in their role, but they didn't kill for the sake of killing, there was still a core of nobility there. The Winged Primarch knew full well that no future was absolute, no dark fate beyond hope of repair, and with the end of the battle he declared even though a darkness hangs over them, a future soaked in blood and horror, they are angels yet. Angels of blood. He split up the isolated legion, and crusading alongside his brother Horus, he had the new companies of the Blood Angels fight alongside the companies of Horus' Lunar Wolves for a decade. He deliberately selected campaigns or battles that had the potential to be glorious victories, ones that required skill and restraint to win, or combined arms using tactics other than the infantry horde the Ninth were used to. The companies were split even further, fighting alongside other legions like the Imperial Fists, and slowly they started to regain a place within the Imperium. When the Ninth finally recombined as one, alongside the first new recruits from Baal, the Blood Angels Legion was a marriage of the old and the new. Still the same furious shock assault force, but now using all the weapons of an Astartes legion, newly supplied through the patronage of their Primarch. They became loved by all, respected by their fellow legions as magnanimous and skilled warriors, and they fought across the crusade in glorious campaigns to free human worlds from the clutches of aliens and monsters. Sanguinius was their saviour, humble, a diplomat between his brothers, one of the most admired and respected of them all, second only to Horus. He embodied the optimism of the new Imperium, and as the crusade drew to a close with the cleansing of Ulanor, and he stood beside his brother Horus at the triumph, there were many who thought that, despite his obvious mutation, he should have been the war master.
At the start of the heresy, the Blood Angels numbered around 120,000 warriors, split into 300 companies of about 500 warriors each. While this, on the face of it, seems similar to the Principia Bellicosa, it wasn't the same thing. It was a new system, devised by Sanguinius when he took over the Legion. Before their remaking, the 9th Legion had been little more than hordes of infantry led by a number of vaunted warlord commanders, respected figures of strength who the warriors of the 9th were willing to follow into battle, often entire equipped as reaver squads with bolters and close combat weapons. Sanguinius's reorganization made the legion much more flexible. Each of the companies could be specialized to deal with specific threats, and they were grouped into hosts at his will, with each host having a mix of specializations. The command of the legion ran parallel to this, organized into three spheres. The third sphere, the Malak, was the line soldiers. The second sphere contained the officers and command and strategic elements. And the first sphere was organized into a series of special units, like the Sanguinary Guard, the Bodyguard of the Primarch, the Crimson Paladin Linebreakers, or the Angel's Tears Destroyer Squads. After this rebuilding, they used all the weapons available to the Legions, but they still had a preference for orbital assault and close combat, favouring jump packs, drop pods, and high-speed strike vehicles with comparatively few defensive assets. They also boasted one of the most powerful fleets in the Legions, with almost 300 capital ships. All this made them one of the strongest Legions of the late Crusade, and a huge huge threat to Horus's rebellion. Mortarion, the Primarch of the Death Guard, had counselled Horus to attack them early on, partly because he and Sanguinius had clashed over the use of psychic powers within the legions. But Horus already had a plan, and as the heresy took root, he dispatched the Blood Angels far away, to Cygnus Prime. Decades earlier, Sanguinius had told Horus of the darkness he saw within his legion, of the tendency for warriors of the Ninth to lose themselves to the fighting, becoming unrecoverable berserkers. He was trying to find a cure. Horus thought this weakness could be exploited. He directed Sanguinius and his legion to the Cygnus Cluster, with the stated aim of wiping out the Nephilim, a Xenos race that enslaved human subjects. But emerging into Cygnus, the Blood Angels found a demon realm, populated by denizens of the Warp, an enemy the Astartes at this time didn't really know how to deal with. Their navigators and astropaths died soon after their retranslation into real space, and the Blood Angels were forced to fight a horrific campaign against the forces of Corn on the surface, led by the bloodthirster Cabanda. Sanguinius and Cabanda fought in single combat as around him the forces of the Blood Angels temporarily lost all cohesion, giving in to a black rage spurred by their exposure to Korn's demons. But eventually Sanguinius and his legion prevailed and they made their escape from the surface. Realizing their betrayal and attempting to reach terror, they became trapped within the Ruin Storm, the great warp storm summoned by the traitors to split the Imperium in half, and were forced to drop out of the warp and head for the strongest Imperial signal they could find. That turned out to be the lighthouse of the Pharaoh in the Ultramar Sector. And together with his brothers Robert Guillemin and Lionel Johnson, Sanguinius was involved in the Imperium's Secondus project, taking on the mantle of heir to the Emperor when it was feared that terror had been lost. But when it was discovered that terror still fought on, the three legions, the Blood Angels, the Dark Angels, and the Ultramarines, pushed on through the storms in an attempt to make it back. In the end, only the Blood Angels would make it back in time for Horus's great siege of the Imperial Palace, and the Ninth Legion would be one of only three legions who stood upon the walls. When the Emperor finally emerged to lay low Horus, Sanguinius accompanied his father and his brother Rogel Dawn aboard Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit but the boarding party were split up, and in the end it was Sanguinius who found Horus first. They fought, and before the Emperor could intervene, Horus killed his brother. The psychic death scream of Sanguinius was heard across terror, and still haunts the Astartes of the Blood Angels all the way into the 41st millennium. And that's the Ninth Legion, a legion designed with a bloody and thankless purpose in mind, possibly designed to be thrown away later in the Crusade, but who was saved and redeemed by their Primarch and remade into one of the most famed legions in the Imperium. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like more heresy info, then click on the little box there to your right, which should be showing you another heresy video. Also, if you'd like to see some of these videos early or just support the channel in general, there's a Patreon link in the thing below. See ya.